All right. My name is Casey Anderson. I'm uh, the president and head guide at Pyramid Fly Company. And I'm going to show you, like Dave said here, flies that'll guarantee 30 pound fish. All right. So, like I said, we're going to start with the fly called the booby. Uh, Mike Sexton pattern. He's also from Reno. Um, one thing about Pyramid is our rolls are solely barbless hooks. So before tying, I always pinch my barb first. And the biggest thing I found out about Pyramid flies is the less materials and the more simple it seems to be the better way to go. Um, they're, they're so toothy and they're actually one of the few salmonid species that have two rows of teeth like a shark. Um, they have very large teeth so they tend to really tear up your flies. And a lot of these flies were also dragging through sand. So most of our flies are more built for durability rather than, than looks. We're looking for certain movements with these flies. And what we're going to do is we're going to tie two floating patterns that we actually fish with sinking line off the bottom. Um, and the way those work is we're going to have, we have big sand flats where these, where the fish come and they cruise these ledges where our sand drops are. And we're actually going to drag our line through that sand and these floating flies are going to be off a tag. And these tags will allow these flies, when I strip it, that fly will sink down and float back up very quickly. So we're getting a jig motion from the bottom with these floating flies. I always use red thread on any sort of bait fish pattern at Pyramid. A lot of the Tui Chub, which is our main bait fish food source, has a lot of exposed gill plates growing up and so do the small trout as they, as they put them in. So I always tie red collars on any of my bait fish patterns and it's, it hands down works far better than not having any red at all on that, on any of your streamers or your bait fish patterns. Um, so we're going to start with this red thread. This is the big fly. Nice and thick so we can cinch everything down. We don't want those teeth cutting through it. We don't want to, as we're dragging it through the sand, having anything that's going to tear up our fly other than making sure we're getting our fish. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a nice base, about two-thirds of the way down. And this is a very simple pattern right here. I have two materials. This right here is the Enrico Puglossi. This is the three-inch brush midnight. And this has a lot of UV. We tie with a lot of UV at Pyramid. Uh, especially during springtime, what happens is their ocular glands expand and their cones will expand. And they tend to pick up UV better a lot, especially during their uh, pre-spawn and then during spawn. So we do tie with a lot of UV. So if you notice, this is just black and UV on a wire brush. And because it's a little bit longer, like I said, we're at about 2 thirds of the way down the hook shank. And we're just going to make it nice and simple, nice and tight all the way up. And like I said, these aren't built for being pretty. These are built for strictly movement and durability. So what I'm going to do is simply just spin this brush as I pull it back, coming around. evenly spaced out. We don't want the body super thick because we want this material to still flow when we're moving or when we're stripping these flies in. So as you can see I'm just brushing it back. I heard someone say are Chewy Chub black. They're actually a lot of brown and gold and silver and black when they're a little bit smaller. Um, what I see, what seems to work really well is high contrast. Um, some of those big fish, their eyesight isn't very good, so something that will push water and still have high contrast seems to be very successful for us. 
And so chewy chub, usually roughly range from one to three inches is gonna be their average size, but they do get up to even 18, 20 inches. Um, an, average, an average adult fish will be about 10 inches. But the cutthroat really key on those one to three inch size fish. One is they mass together a lot easier and what the, what the large fish will do is actually come up and they won't try to sometimes grab a fish in particular, they'll actually come up and they'll throw their head and tail around and try to smash as many fish as they can in a bait ball. And as those fish are stunned and killed and they start to sink down, the fish will come below that and easily eat multiple at a time instead of wasting a lot of energy on one. Also too, it's a lot easier to, to digest multiple small fish than it is one big large fish. Right, it'd be like eating a whole entire steak meal and then trying to run a marathon. So we're gonna cinch down this fiber here again, just making a really thick collar because this will get dragged through the sand. And what I have here is tube foam. It comes in all different types of colors, different densities. And what I'm gonna do is kinda of just cut off these little excess points here just to make it a little bit more flush and even. So we have a nice cut even space right here. And just like dumbbell eyes, I'm just gonna lay this over the top and do our crisscross over that. And I want it to be nice and even. And like I said, we're not building for necessarily looks. Yep, this is the booby. We all like boobies. So right here, as you can see, just like the dumbbell eyes are, and you can see how one side's longer than the other. This is the most important part of these boobies is we want to have even eyes. Because if our eyes are uneven, that fly will end up spinning on itself and twist up your line or it'll sit sideways with the hook coming out to the side. So we wanna to try to get our eyes even as possible. And I'm really gonna build up that red this red nose and collar on this here. So I'll come in and kind of look over it from the top there. Trim down so it's generally the same size. So once we have these tied on, just a couple wraps right behind that eye, and we're just gonna do a little whip finish. You can put, uh, if you like to use any sort of sallies or UV, any sort of hardener, um, you can either put it on before or after. But like I said, we're gonna be dragging these, these through the sand, so we wanna make sure they're tough as possible, and by the end of the, a few fish later, these are going to look like chewed bubble gum on these eyes. Right, so sorry, I didn't even do the recipe here. So on this hook, this one is actually a little bit thinner than I prefer. Um, any sort of stripping or bait fish pattern, I really try to use a 3X heavy hook. Um, a lot of these patterns are a little bit smaller. So if you get, a, if you get the size, I like, really like those, the Mustad size 10, just straight shank um, and 3X heavy, even a 2X short and 3X heavy to real stout, medium bend. We're not getting too outrageous on our bend there. And we wanna just make sure everything is as solid as possible because we're gonna be using anywhere from 15 to 20 pound test while we're stripping these flies. So if we get into a fish that's over 20 pounds and we have a 15 pound test and we're fighting that fish, the last thing we wanna happen is for that hook to bend out. So here's just a little bit of UV hardener. Uh, 
And I'll really kind of pack it on that bottom there, like I said, because we're going through, dragging that through the sand. And one thing I really like to cure my UV faster is this, actually it's a laser point, but it's a UV laser pointer. Really, really strong. Cures it pretty, in, pretty much instantly there. And like I said, I'm really building up that, this back collar right here because we're dragging that right through the sand. So as simple as this is, this is one of the most effective stripping flies that we have. All it is is just it looks like a small bait fish. These eyes are going to push a lot of that water and make a lot of that movement as we're stripping it through. One thing that you could do too on any other sort of still water, anything that you guys are fishing, damsel flies or anything else, is scale all this down and tie a lot of olive patterns. Because of the damsel fly making a lot of movement but not going very fast, if you're fishing one of these booby flies, scale down, you could do the olive eyes and olive body, however you like, whether it's a marabou tail or any sort of material. If you fish it with an intermediate line, you'll be able to fish that with a lot of movement, but you're really not going where at the same time. So if you have a lot of loose fibers on that back, and we're stripping that real, real slow and quick at the same time where we're doing those little short strips like we would for a damselfly, it's one of the most effective damselfly patterns I've used still water wise. And I'm sure you can see it just, you know, obviously it looks like the eyes and everything too, if you can imagine that scale down and it being all olive. Really, really effective, especially in springtime at Pyramid Lake. But all this is doing is just mimicking a bait fish pattern. So as we're, what's going to happen is this is going to float off the bottom here. And every time we strip, it's going to dart down and float back up, dart down, float back up, dart down, float back up. And we're actually getting a jig motion Instead of, you know, having a fly that's heavy and we're pulling it up, it's essentially doing the same motion, but the fly is doing all the work for us. All we have to do is pull our strip in. So that all depends on, on the weather and the depth we're trying to fish. There's a lot of, there's a lot of um, parts of the lake that are very shallow with a quick drop, and that's a lot of where we're fishing our fish. We don't have too many vegetation structures or big rock structures throughout the lake that the fish can kind of take cover on and use as ambush points. What they do is they cruise these sand ledges and we're casting past the ledge and bringing that up into the flat. And they'll come up and see the, as they're cruising that ledge that comes perpendicular, they come and see that and they'll chase it onto the flat. And you know, they don't want that to get away into that shallow water. And it's a nice ambush point on that ledge. They have deep water access if they need to get away. And so depending, because the on the other end too, there's big rock structures with really deep drops. Um, one of the most effective ways to actually fish this is still with um, amnesia or big game fluoro in a shooting head. And the reason for that is we get a lot of wind and strong currents at Pyramid Lake. So if you have a shooting head with a floating line, by the time that you're sinking, you're way off to one of the side or the other and you have a big bend in your line. If you're using the, that big game floor amnesia with a heavy, you know, anywhere, anything from a T11, T14, with that shooting head, you're straight down the bottom and as soon as you come tight to it, you're not getting that big wash like you would with you know, a floating line or an intermediate line. So a lot of the times like a full sink or a shooting head with a, a running line that is amnesia or like a big game fluoro really works well. Uh, one of our favorite lines is called the Airflow 40 Plus and that's a shooting head, it's a 36 foot shooting head with uh, intermediate running line. And it's a 120 foot line so you can really get some good casts out there. Um, any more questions on the booby? In this pattern, you can be tied in so many different ways. You have the chenille and a marabou combination, and it really, this is a really fun pattern to um, just play with and kind of perfect your, your bait fish patterns as you like. But like I said, these, the, simple, the more simple the pattern, 
seems to be very effective. And you can see this, this fiber actually hides the hook fairly well. Any more questions on the booby before we move on to the next fly? Awesome. All right, this next one is also going to be a floating fly. Yeah, definitely. Do you ever uh, paint eyeballs on the end of the... Of course, of course. Paint, painting eyeballs. Um, if you find the right type of foam, you can actually stick those, the eyeballs that you would on, say, a streamer or any of those, like a fish head. Yeah. You can actually stick those on the side of this, and uh, it works really well. Same thing if you get the red eyes and do that red collar. But um, yeah, painting eyeballs is always a great option. I actually had a red Sharpie in my pocket that will just poke a dot right on the side. But that's a, that's a great question, and it, and it is very, very effective, especially something with eyes. Um, I'm sure since you asked the question, you've noticed the difference from eyes and not eyes on, on certain flies. Um, and you can make them as long as you'd like. A really good one, is too, is the long, you know, loose marabou tail. That way, when it's floating up and down, it's getting a lot of that, um, a lot of that wavy movement coming through. And um, so this next one here is called the popcorn beetle. This one was designed specifically for Pyramid Lake based off some other small kind of gurgler. It's like a smaller gurgler and based off some other beetle patterns. But this right here is three millimeter foam. Um, you can use any color you like. This one's an also a really fun one to play with as well. So this is our size 10 hook. I do wish it was a little bit thicker, but like I said earlier, um, pyramid is strictly barbless hooks only. So every time, if I'm making a pyramid fly, just make it a habit of pinching that barb, whether you like to use your pliers or your vise. That way you don't get caught because they, um, they do check quite often and they've, I've had a couple buddies that even have been caught and swabbed to make sure that their barb isn't sticking out. Um, and they do, they, like I said, they do a really good job of keeping on it. Um, they keep people honest. They are very forgiving on, you know, first times. They'd like to do a lot of warnings and everything like that. But if you're someone who has been caught multiple times, um, they'll definitely pull your license and they'll blackball you from the lake just for fishing barbs, which is nice keeping the fishery that way. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut a strip off of this, say about a little over half an inch. And this is something that we've experimented with for a long time as far as the thickness of the foam and the positioning of it. So I have a nice little piece right here. If you notice, it's just about twice the size of my hook shank. What I'm going to do here again is just create that nice base because we're going to lay this whole fly over this whole hook shank. Nice and even there. And this one's, like I said, another fun one too. If you like to use dubbing, you can do dubbing. If any type of chenille you like to use, if you like to make your own um, dubbing brushes or anything like that. So right here I have a Midnight Cowboy. This one is a really popular color out at Pyramid. And if you notice again, high contrast with UV in it. So I'm going to cut a strip of my chenille. And there's real no specifics on the type of chenille you, you want to use. It's whatever really is kind of your preference on that. So I can either tie it with just the chenille and the foam, or I can add a tail to it with marabou. And we want to really get some nice wiggle movement out of it. So we're going to be really p peculiar on which, which pieces of the feather we're going to pick out there. 
And I don't tie really thick ones, I don't really tie thick tails. I want to make sure I get a lot of that excess moving off that back. So I'm going to tie that tail down first. And like I said, these aren't meant to be necessarily as pretty as some of the dry flies that you guys might be tying. I'm just securing this, making a nice even body. So we have a nice loose tail there. So now I'm going to take my three millimeter foam. I'm going to pinch this on the back just about as far out as the point of that hook. And then from there, we're going to wrap that nice and tight. And if you notice, it might look like I'm doing excess wraps, but again, I, like I said, it's just for solely for durability because this foam will turn into bubble gum after a few fish. So again, putting my chenille at the back again. And this fly doesn't necessarily need as even of a body. So from here, I'm going to take the chenille and create my underbody with this. Clip that off. So now I have a nice midnight cowboy colored underbody. And with this three millimeter foam, I'm going to fold it over the top. Pull a little tight there. And notice how I'm kind of building up this red under on this neck part right here. I'm trying to show those exposed gill plates again. So I'm going to pinch it down. Those, and one big thing about this foam here is those first initial wraps on that three millimeter foam, we don't want to cinch them down too tight because you'll end up chopping your foam in half. So I'll lay a couple light wraps down and then from there start to cinch it down. And if you notice, we're building again that little bit of a thicker red collar. So from right under there, get a few little secure wraps. We'll do our whip finish. So the same thing as the booby, the most important part about this fly is going to be this front lip. If it's too small, we're not going to get any movement. If it's too big, it's going to spin around in a circle. So what I like to do, and what I mean by too small is being non-existent and too big where it, obviously this looks a little over exaggerated and silly, but I do want to make sure it does hang over the eye of that hook so I'm past it. I also want to make sure that I'm nice and straight because again, if I, if I cut my foam in a slant, if I cut this at a slant, it'll also make that fly spin and, all, and our line will be twisted up as we're stripping in. All right, so if anyone's seen a gurgler, this is a very simple, smaller version of that. And this fly is really fun to fish. What's going to happen is it's the same thing as a booby. We're fishing this off the bottom with that sinking line. And because of these flies being floating, we actually, like I was saying earlier, we're going to fish them off a tag. And we'll fish our sinking fly below that. So a normal rig would be we actually fish our flies, I always fish my flies three feet or farther apart because we do have the fish that are breaking that three foot mark. I think the largest fish we had last year was 37 and a half inches. Um, we don't want to hook into our big fish of a lifetime and because we have a 24 inch tag or an 18 inch tag, when that fish is swimming away, we get hooked by that back fly or that front fly and it pops it out of its mouth and then you're on a run with a foul hook 20 pound fish that's all pissed off and fired up. 
So from, our, from that, the start of our, of our leader, we, I do anywhere from three to four feet. And you're actually better off being closer to your, the tip of your shooting head than you are the distance between your flies. So you're better off running two feet from, the, from your first fly to, your, to the start of your shooting head than you are running two feet together from your flies. Um, and the reason we run these off a of tag is because when these fish come in and that fly is floating, they come in and go, Goo! If you're running it off the back and you have a four foot long tag coming off like this, that, all that fish has to do is come up and inhale it and you're in, you know, in its throat and its gills and its gullet. And that's the reason that we fish these off a of tag. Plus it regulates how high we're coming off and we're able to feel that grab. Because a lot of the times if you're up here too, because they will grab it if it's just sitting there like power bait too, because it's coming up and it's floating like this and they're coming by and they'll grab it and you'll be sitting there talking to your friend between strips and all of a sudden you're getting hammered. So like I was saying, we're fishing this off a tag. You, you can run about a you know, four to six inch tag and we're doing three to four feet to a sinking fly that's gonna be dragging more on the bottom. This one's running off a tag. And what's gonna happen is same thing where that fly is floating up. Every time we strip, because of this lip, that fly is gonna wiggle down and then float up. Wiggle down, float up, wiggle down, float up, wiggle down, float up as we're stripping it in. So you can imagine every time you strip it, that fly is wiggling down towards that bottom and then it's floating up really quick. This tail is gonna follow all those movements there. And this is a really, really enticing fly for any cutthroat who's feeling very predatory at the time or maybe even not hungry. You're gonna get an aggression strike solely from that fly moving back and forth and floating up and down. Um, jig fishing is so proficient out there from spin fishermen that we kind of had to adapt our own way of jig fishing that wasn't, you know, throwing big loop oval casts to try to throw jig heads with floated with, you know, 20 foot leaders and trying to strip those in. This is our sort of, you know, rendition of jig fishing and it, and it works great. This, this, this flies, you know, along the side of a woolly bugger, woolly worm, has probably caught more 20 pound fish than most flies on the lake. Um, solely just because of the movement. And realistically, anything that you want to fish behind this here will be very effective too. Um, since the 60, 60s up until just recently, the pretty much the only way that people fished it was sinking line and fishing woolly buggers and woolly worms, just stripping. The old timers that I remember talking to when I first started fishing there, if you want to get big red, you got to be on the bottom. And that was all they, that's all they would talk about. And they think floating flies are cheating. They think indicators are cheating. Everything else is cheating except for stripping those flies off that bottom. All right, so anybody questions about the beetle? So black's your favorite color for the foam and the tail? Uh, black and olive are my personal favorites. Um, a really, really good one also is white and chartreuse. Um, chartreuse is a really, really good color. Uh, black and purple is a great combo. White and chartreuse, black and red. But I really like, if, I, if I'm throwing a black, um, a black fly, I'll throw a white fly behind it and just have those two high contrast flies to where they're gonna pick up one or the other. Um, a lot of the times, during the beginning of our season, a late season, is when we have a lot of tui chub that are up higher in the water column, especially during a little bit after spring. They've spawned and they have all the hatchlings that are coming out. Um, that's a really good time to fish olive. But other times through the year, the best way, I think, personally, is you can have accents of those hot colors, like a red or a chartreuse or a purple, but having a white or a black or a black and a white mixture of those high contrast seems to be the most productive for me when fishing a sinking line. No matter what you do, um, they're gonna be a very, very effective way to fish, depending on, you know, obviously what type of species of bait fish and leeches and different types of bugs you have underneath there. So, is anybody not familiar with a balanced leech at all? Have no idea what it is? Perfect. Um, for, the, for those of you who don't know, this is going to be an amazing fly for you to use, especially if you fish uh, still water. 
Phil Rowley and Brian Chan are big advocates of the balanced leech as well. Um, some, a lot of think that Phil Rowley was kind of the innovator, but it was actually a guy from Washington, um, brought it up to Canada, and then Brian Chan and Phil Rowley kind of made it their thing after that. And ever since then, it's been a still water magic tool for me. Um, a lot of our big fish during slower times of the year uh, come off these balanced leeches. So what I'm going to do here is I have a 90 degree jig hook. This is a size 8 mustad. Again, pinch the barb. And then what I have here also is a, this is a finishing nail. You can use, there's different types of nails you can use. Here, this one right here is another finishing nail. You can get them at Home Depot, Hobby Lobby. For, for smaller ones, these pins work really well. But depending on the size of the way you use, the pin will sometimes slip out of that small part of the eye there. So what we're going to do, is we're going to take this gold finishing nail here. A lot of times you have to cut these down to size to add extra weight. And what's going to make this balanced is what we're going to do is put the weight in front of the eye of that hook. And by doing that, oh, get out of the bead. We're going to slide the bead onto this pin. And I actually like to go a lot of the times backwards with that, with the big opening first. So it looks like this. And what I'm going to do with that is same thing, I tie my base layer, get those wraps in. And I'm going to tie this to the bottom of that hook shank to where this bead is about a bead length away from the eye of that hook. If it's too short, that'll be when it sits, it'll be hook heavy. If it's too far out, then it'll be too front heavy and these tend to move after I tie them. But if I just go about the width of the bead, maybe a little bit smaller off the front of that eye, Really want to secure this. Right, so now we have this heavy weight. This, I believe, is a four millimeter tungsten. When you're tying these balanced leeches, you always want to use tungsten. If you use brass or any other material, it's going to sit hooked down. And the reason these, call, these are called balanced is when we're, when we're, if our line is coming down here, our eye of the hook is here, and because of this weight in the hook, the fly is going to sit perpendicular to the line or parallel to the bottom. So anytime that line moves, the fly is going to come up and then sink back down. And we're getting that jig motion from it being hung this way. So like I was saying, this is how it's going to sit if you don't use tungsten under the water. So from here, we can just kind of continue on to that little back right before the bend. This one will do olive. And the same thing with the tail of the beetle. I want to tie these tails fairly sparse. I want a lot of movement in these. So the nice long strung marabou there's probably maybe 10 strands in there. And we're going to wrap that body with dubbing so we're not super worried on that part right there. And having this light, nice long tail is going to add a lot of movement when these are underwater. And one thing we really got to think about when we're tying these balanced leeches, especially 
a lot of the times we're fishing them under indicators is it's everybody ties them like streamers but when, if, when it's sitting like this and it's not being pulled or there's no current against it, it's not gonna fish like a streamer. All that material, that's, if, you have, if you have really dense material, all of it's just gonna sink and it looks like a big clump of fly tying material in it. So when I tie these, I wanna be really cautious as to how much material I'm putting onto this body and also where that material's laying. Because if I put a really big long collar of this dubbing, and it just sits there and it's sitting like this underwater and we're getting a little bit of wave movement or stripping movement, all that material is just gonna hang and dangle down and not look like that uh, bait fish pattern we're supposed to. So I got a nice long tail there. I'm going to create my dubbing loop. It doesn't slip off the back there. And then once I have my loop, I'm going to bring it all the way up to the front. Now I really tie these fairly sparse. not getting big clumps and it's nice and spread out even there. So this is a peacock dubbing right here. Definitely one of my favorites. I actually caught the biggest fish, um, my personal best, out of Pyramid on a peacock balance leech. So it's nice and loose. You can see that the fibers are sticking out quite a bit. We still want movement, but we don't want too thick of a body there. So I'm going to spin that nice and tight, make sure we're kind of spread out there, nice and even. When I'm still splayed out, I have a lot of these fibers sticking out. So once I get it nice and tight, I'll even come in with the dubbing brush after. Perk some of those up. And then from there, I'm going to start that wrap. Still again, pulling those fibers back so we're, when we lay them down, they're on that backward facing. And again, big red collar for those exposed gill plates. So this right here is what I'm talking about. Right, so if I'm tying a streamer, this would be nice because this is gonna be nice and pushed back when I'm stripping it. But when this is laid down and I'm fishing it you know, much slower or with an indicator, which how these are normally gonna be fished, all this material is just gonna hang like that, if you can imagine it, it actually sits up that way. But all this material would just hang there and by no means looking appealing to that fish coming by. So again, I'll wrap that, make a nice big exposed collar there. And again, that's going to add durability and it's going to add that red accent exposed gill plate. And it looks silly on these thick collars, but like I said, these are tried and true ways of tying these for Pyramid Lake specifically. Um, I'm not sure, you know, as far as I've, I've pretty much tied these anywhere else I've fished them and they've worked great, but Pyramid specifically having the red eye or that red collar is a really, really big ticket. So what I'm going to do is brush this out 
and I'm going to find some of those longer fibers, especially towards that bottom. I'm actually going to clip these down, pull a few out, and as, particularly on the bottom is where we don't want a lot of those hanging fibers. Some on the sides and some on the top is going to be all right, but when the big when these get really long on the bottom, like I said, they like to hang and you essentially look like you're just a big piece of algae off that bottom there. And I get real specific and I'll play with these a lot underwater too to make sure I have that same taper, uh, that natural teardrop taper as all bait fish and small creatures do. So the eye of the hook is right there. And I'll show you an example of this. And we'd much rather have them being front heavy than back heavy. Because if it's back heavy, you're not getting that movement that's needed. I'm just going to hang this on this thread here so those of you can see. Notice how it's just slightly front heavy there. Every time it gets pulled up, it's going to move up and it's going to wiggle down and move up and wiggle down. And a lot of the times we're fishing these under indicators because when those fish, if they're few and far between and we're not getting big schools coming through those ledges like we normally are, we're waiting for those a couple big fish a day that might be cruising that ledge. If we're fishing a balanced leech right on the other side of that ledge, we're getting the big waves from Pyramid fishing heavy indicator rigs. Every time your indicator goes up and down, that fish is going up and down and we can just jig these flies right along that ledge waiting for those fish to come by. Um, very effective pattern. And like I said, a lot of these don't look the prettiest, but the way that they're, the way that they're tied, um, myself and my other guides have been doing a lot of experimenting with all the small aspects of these flies here. And same way you could tie these with this, with the EP fiber. Um, I've done that plenty of times. It works great. You can trim it down really nice. Um, any sort of dubbing combo. And we'll tie these anywhere from tens and eights all the way up to big balance bait fish in size twos and fours. Um, you know, really big cone head, tungsten beads, large finishing nails, and by the end they're about, you know, three to four inches sometimes fishing that way. And a lot of the way we fish out at Pyramid is with switch rods when we're indicator fishing. Because of fishing heavy flies, the chronomids we fish, our, our weighted heavy chronomids are size six, around size six and eight. A lot of times we'll have duck, double tungsten beads on them and that weight is to help keep everything straight when we're fishing with indicators. So we'll fish our indicator, a really large midge for that weight, and then our point fly, whether it be a balanced leech or a smaller nymph or coronamid. But we're always fishing a bigger top fly just so when we're having that, when we have our indicator, if we're tight to that indicator as possible, then whatever feeling or any sort of movement we get, that indicator is going to sense that. If our, if our indicator is weighted properly, we have that heavy fly, we're st strictly from there, and then our point fly is at the bottom. Even if our, if our point fly is nice and light floating around, we can actually still see that take if our, if our main fly is really heavy, even if it's floating out here and it gets touched, and then we're, that indicator's down. What's that? I think so.